Welcome to a new episode of Devs on Tape. Thank you for having me. Yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty excited to meet our guest today. Today we are recording without Kai, we are, we are on the Doha conference and exhibition right now. And Kai is currently in one of these panels, so we are just two people. Two awesome right? ladies. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> and would you like to introduce you? Yeah, sure. So I'm Dr. Melissa Sassi, and I'm trying to think of how to make sure I give you a succinct overview of how I fit into the world. But I've spent the last 10 years working in tech between IBM and Microsoft. I left IBM, I guess it's been like a year and a half ago or so, and I run a venture studio. So over the last 10 years, I have uh, scouted and accelerated Uh, 225 tech startups, wow. 75 countries, and uh, more than uh, 450 million dollars in investment capital. So I, I don't want to take credit for the investment <laughs> capital completely. Obviously, when you're a tech founder, you deserve all the credit. But uh, lo lots of uh, work went into scouting and uh, enabling. And I spent a number of years working on Wall Street, built a bank. I'm very passionate about digital skills. And we'll talk a little bit about what I'm talking about today mm -hmm. in a second. But yeah, those are some highlights about my career. I would say three things that I'm most proud of in, in my career. One, I was part of creating the first world standard for what it means to be digitally skilled and ready. So imagine you are a minister of education. Mm -hmm. in whatever country. And naturally, all ministers of education, all teachers, all educators, or parents want our young people to be digitally skilled and ready for the future. And keep in mind, I don't necessarily mean everybody needs to code. I don't mean everybody needs to be an engineer, but we all need to have some kind of skills to help us uh, thrive in the future. And I worked with an amazing team of people and I'm the founder of uh, creating the working group with an IEEE that um, led to the creation of the first world standard. And it is an IEEE standard now. So that's wow. one, of my, one of my claims to fame. <laughs> It's been adopted by a number of different countries from around the world when um, young people are you know, going through their educational journeys and learning you know, what does it take to be digitally intelligent or digitally literate, if you will. Second claim to fame, I used to build internet connectivity solutions around the world. I wasn't the one with screwdrivers and hammers and <laughs> lugging equipment around, but I was an impact investor. So I was the one who supplied the money from Microsoft. That was my job mm -hmm. as an impact investor. We built internet connectivity solutions around the world and got people digitally skilled. I can say that the Dalai Lama has access to the internet because of one of my projects. He has no idea I yeah. exist, but that doesn't matter. He has access to the internet because of my, one of my projects. Yeah. And then my last claim to fame, and there's probably more, but this is the third thing I'd like to share. When I was at IBM and I ran the Startup Accelerator, one day the music producer, Timbaland, and I don't know if you or any other listeners know who Timbaland is. He's the kind of guy who's worked with everyone, <laughs> Justin Timberlake, Madonna, everyone. And he is, you know, a few years ago, was voted time, Times 100 Most Influential People in the World. The day that was announced, he was on my podcast and he applied to my program. And I was part of helping build his startup called Beat Club, which is all about democratizing access to the music industry. So a few cool oh, things wow. in my career that I'm proud of. Yeah. So for me, it's not just a few cool things. You are full of cool things. <laughs> you know, I think um, it's really important in, for me anyway, in my career mm -hmm. um, and just in my life to kind of look at what are those like crazy wild things that mm -hmm. you think or other people think it's impossible to achieve that. That's impossible. Mm -hmm. You're, how are you going to connect these things together? And I don't want to get weird and put a tinfoil hat on and all of a sudden go down this crazy pathway. But if you can dream it, ah, mm -hmm. if you can dream it, it's possible. And sometimes you can connect all these crazy things that are not connected and make them possible mm -hmm. as long as you dream it. Oh, it's a nice message. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. But you did all these great and fantastic things. 
And you are talking about maybe of a completely different thing today because you are talking But about the But I think the, the two things are connected. Yeah, that's They true. Are. And Somehow, we'll talk yeah. about that in a second. <laughs> But yes, yeah, so I'm talking about imposter syndrome. And I think most people, when they hear me talk and they're like, wait a second, I've seen pictures of you at the White House in like mm -hmm. leather pants leading a meeting. Mm -hmm. If you're an imposter, like... How did you go to the How did you go to the White House in leather pants? Yeah, I've seen you in present in with prime ministers. I've seen you on the red carpet in the south of France at the film festival. You've went to all these like amazing things, done all this amazing stuff. How, why are you? What gives you the right to talk about mm -hmm. imposter syndrome? And I think for whatever reason, a lot of people who are either overachievers or people who are on the stage, if you will, or are in, in the limelight and people who search for opportunities to be out there and be present, a lot of them, for whatever reason, suffer from imposter mm -hmm. syndrome. And they think, holy smokes, is this the day that I'm <laughs> finally going to be found out that I'm a total fraud and I'm an imposter? Mm -hmm. And it's many of us think that if you, let's say, for example, had a hundred things you needed to do for your, to you to get an A plus on your assignment, for mm -hmm. you to get a hundred percent on your assignment. And I, when I say assignment, I mean it at work because mm -hmm. I have, it's been a long time since I've been in school, but you've got all these goals that you're supposed to achieve throughout the year. Mm -hmm. And let's just imagine you've got this really big goal and you achieve the big goal. Mm -hmm. But let's imagine there are 10 little things that go into making sure that big goal you hit it. Mm -hmm. Let's imagine one of those things, like half of it I didn't do and half of it I did or half of it didn't work for whatever reason. Instead of focusing on, holy smokes, I just achieved this awesome goal. Holy smokes, Timbaland is on my podcast. We're wearing matching sweatshirts <laughs> and he just changed clothes so he could look like me. <laughs> Instead of thinking about that, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know what? My shirt was wrinkled though. When yeah. <laughs> nobody could see that the shirt was wrinkled or, oh my gosh, when I did that opening, I stumbled a little bit mm. and I accidentally forgot to mention blah, blah, and blah. Mm. Nobody else pays attention. Nobody else realized you screwed that up, mm. but it's where your mind is, is focusing. So I think sometimes what that does is makes you overthink, mm. oh, do I belong here? Am I... Am I going to get kicked off the stage where they're finally going to find out that mm -hmm. I'm a total fraud and I don't belong here? I don't know what I'm doing. I'm getting over it, though. I think I've gotten over it, but sometimes when I say I'm over it, then other times I catch myself thinking about, oh, gosh, do I belong in this thing or... Is it like a more, in your specific case, is, this, is it like more topic-based or is it just from day to day? Funny enough, one of the things that I talk about in, in my imposter syndrome mm -hmm. talk is it's often situational mm -hmm. and that could be, and each of us are different. So a certain kind of person, mm -hmm. like a personality type, if you will, it, that sets us off or triggers us or whatever. It may be a certain place mm -hmm. or a certain kind of place. It may be a specific person. So I think what's really important, though, is understanding and knowing when do we feel that way mm -hmm. and dissecting, okay, wait a second, because sometimes you realize, wait a second, when I'm always around mm -hmm. this particular person, I feel that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, wait a second. Is that person actually a jerk? <laughs> So I think sometimes yeah. <laughs> you just have to really balance that, that voice that you have in your head and say, okay, I know I'm always beating myself up in my head. Like, oh, you didn't do that. Oh, you didn't do this. Right. We all have that silly voice yeah. that we have to combat with a positive instead of a negative. But sometimes we also have to recognize that, hey, wait a second. Sometimes people are just jerks and they want to make you feel that way yeah. because of something going on with them and not you. And I think over... The last few years, I've seen a lot of instances where people will talk about this thing called imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. when in reality, it's just a toxic work environment or a mm -hmm. toxic team or a toxic person. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important for those of us who have that voice to recognize when is it that we really just need to work better with ourselves and that inner voice? And when is it that we recognize that, no, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. No, I'm okay. It's actually you. And sometimes it's hard to stand up for ourselves yeah. and know how to do that in a productive way or tactful way 
especially if it's our boss or someone more senior than us or someone even maybe we look up to or maybe have looked up to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also suffered from this imposter syndrome thing and I remember one specific uh, situation and I would like to know what do you think yeah, about yeah, it yeah, and me. give tips for example and I'm freelancer so I'm self-employed I yeah. go to uh, my customers and um, help them developing things and database yeah. etc and I know I'm, I do it, don't know, for 13, 15 years or so. So yeah. I'm an expert. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and in this specific situation, I, I remember I did something different than uh, in my other project. So it yeah. was new, but it was not... Um, was it like a new approach or just a new way of thing, way of getting things done that the customer, um, you know, familiar with based on working with you the last time? Yeah, it was some kind of, some a new approach. Like a technical? like a yeah. technical approach to doing okay yeah understood. so but it wasn't complicated so it was just different Something new. Yeah. and i remember that i wanted to do it perfect uh, yeah so i thought perfectionism is a thing yeah. It's, yeah the whole time i thought oh my god i i hope i'm fast enough i, I do it good enough um, yeah, yeah, yeah. and every time someone looked over my shoulder they said oh you're so fast uh, yeah nice and i just thought Are they lying to me? Yeah. Are they hoping yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm doing yeah. it fast then? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What do you think? Because you talked about this toxic thing, your boss or so, or some mean colleagues or so. Yeah. And on the other side, there's also the inner part yeah. you have uh, to do. I think in, the, in reality, we're meaner to ourselves mm -hmm. than any anything that usually, I don't want to say that in every instance, because sometimes there's just some mean people who do some mean stuff. But I think overarchingly, if you think about the voice, the, like the words you use with yourself mm -hmm. are often much harsher than the words anyone would ever use with you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I think sometimes if you let it go unchecked, it just keeps going and going and it never stops. And I realized when I first started talking about imposter syndrome. I did this thing where I recognized that the voice was there. Mm -hmm. But as I started recognizing that the voice was there, it, it felt like it was always there because mm -hmm. I was paying attention to it. And then I think early on, a lot of people I heard talking about embracing your vulnerability, uh, uh, your vulnerabilities mm -hmm. and talking about them and blah, blah, blah. And mm -hmm. I found that... I was like verbalizing things that kind of almost were like self-perpetuating meaning, like it was just the focus. And mm -hmm. I realized that I don't think that is actually the answer to making you feel better or resolving it or, you know, combating it. Yeah, it's okay to recognize that this thing is there, but the moment you start to verbalize what's happening, mm -hmm. there's this, you've heard, I don't know, a lot of people have used this flow where you think about it being your thoughts become mm -hmm. your words, become your actions, become your blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And then you get to your, your destiny. Mm -hmm. And I think the more you focus on ver hearing that, verbalizing it, so saying out loud, it, it's like it, it almost becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important to recognize what happens. Mm -hmm. But I go back on some things that I used to say about, yeah, let's accept it. Let's talk about it. Yeah. But at some point it's like, why am I going to verbalize that my voice inside my head says, wow, Melissa, you're too fat. Wow, Melissa, you can't wear those same clothes anymore. Mm -hmm. Does that, what, what does that do for anyone? Mm -hmm. It doesn't do anything good for anyone. And so why talk about it? If I recognize that it's there And I make a point to not talk about it. Not that I'm trying to shadow it over you mm -hmm. know, or pretend like it's not there, but, and you could call that this, it could be your skills. It could be something you're afraid of, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I just gave an example, but what good does that do for anyone? Not really anything. And so I'm more focused now on really taking those negative thoughts and thinking about What's the opposite of that, mm -hmm. right? And how do I think about when I know I'm thinking something negative, I automatically do the positive mm -hmm. of it and I say the positive. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm by myself at home, <laughs> I know it's really creepy and I, I'll just turn it into me talking with my dogs and be like, your mom looks so great today, doesn't she? <laughs> Or, and I know I'm using examples in my looks. Yeah. That's not always what I talk about. Trust me. Or we're going to rock this presentation right now. Mm -hmm. 
so I'm not a developer. Mm-hmm. I'm not an engineer. I couldn't code my way out of a cardboard box. Mm-hmm. And I spent the last 10 years of my life in tech, mm-hmm. working with very technical teams, and in some cases managing groups of engineers or data scientists or whatever. And I used to feel like an imposter mm-hmm. thinking, what am I doing managing these individuals when I don't actually understand what they're doing? I don't understand their work. And... Um, it took me a little while to get over that. I'm over that now. Hey, I've got strengths. You've got strengths. So what if I don't know how to make your peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Or your, <laughs> I don't know, your Spetzel or whatever. I'm trying to think of a, a German example, <laughs> which is not exactly the same, but there you go. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, n- nice tip. This, if you think something negative, you should turn it into something positive. Yeah, what's the opposite of that? To... And talk, you yeah. know, verbalize that. Talk about it. Yeah. I have one more question because I am always part of this conference thing yeah, yeah. and I always try to motivate especially young people For to sure. do some presentations and they are often struggling should I talk about something I don't have something to talk etc but they are also struggling with their self esteem I think it's it's, they experienced enough to go out and talk about that yeah for example what I like to do is instead of pulling young person A, B and C to come on and do solo presentations mm-hmm. about something that they're working on or they're doing I often like to have um, those situations where I pull a panel together mm-hmm. and will often say where you've got like different people at different stages of their careers talking about their area of experience mm-hmm. and what they're working on or doing and also I'll, I'll often incorporating that as the voice of youth or the voice of a new entrant into into tech or into job a b or c whatever it is mm-hmm. or the the voice of a fresher whatever the right word the right politically correct word is wherever you are so that it's a little bit less cumbersome and a little bit less stressful for them yeah and That's just one of the things that I like to do. I'll give you an example. I stumbled upon this young woman Mm -hmm. when I was at IBM and she attended one of my talks and it was just as COVID was like getting started. So I spent some time and she was 15 Mm -hmm. and I was giving this talk to young students about what they can do during this COVID craziness Mm -hmm. of your schools are canceled or you're out of school. What can you do with this time Mm -hmm. and how can you... Use this time to better yourself and foster your career. Mm. And this event had 2,000 young people join. It was crazy. I was like, wow, I I need to do this more often. And there was this 15-year-old girl who was like, and I joke about it now, she was totally spamming the audience. I want to talk to Melissa. I need to talk to Melissa. (laughs) And I was like, and I had all kinds of people like reaching out to me as I was presenting in WhatsApp on my cell phone. And I was like, what is going on here? And then I realized this Whatever I said, it resonated with this 15-year-old girl in the UK. And so they're like, will you agree to talk with her? I said, yes, just tell her yes. Mm -hmm. And at first I thought, okay, I don't know what I can do for this young woman. But I'd spent a lot of time like mentoring young people. And I have my own nonprofit that I started about eight years ago where we've taught tens of thousands of young people to code in 12 countries, Mm -hmm. which is funny. Like I I say, I I don't know how to code (laughs) yet. Tens of thousands of people know how to code because it's something I created. Yet I still feel like an imposter with a bunch of tech people, right? What's going on? Melissa, what are you saying? And... I got on the phone with her, this mm-hmm. video call afterward. And we talked like that week and I was like, I, I just was like, okay, I'll agree to have a talk with her. And mm-hmm. that's going to be it. I got on the phone with this woman. And I say woman because she was absolutely amazing. She like blew my socks off. Yeah. Okay. She blew my mind. The way that she looked at things, thought about things, expressed herself. Yeah. Was like, hands down, more amazing than one, anything I'd expected. And I realized like... I had judged her based on thinking, she's 15, here's what that's going to mean. I totally judged her wrong. And I used whatever, you know, my perceptions were to, you know, I guess capture in my mind what I thought the conversation was going to be. And she said to me, I I really liked what you were saying. I just wanted to tell you, I'd like to volunteer with you. I'd like to um, challenge myself Mm -hmm. to see if you'd be willing to just work with me. I was like, you know what? I made this split decision on the phone. I was like, would you like to be my student senator? I had no idea what a student senator was, but <laughs> I came up to was what's a student senator? I said, I have no idea. You figure out what it is and what it does, yeah. and then you're that. And I said, first thing, let's get your let's get you working on your LinkedIn profile so that it's something that other people can look at and understand like where have you been? Mm-hmm. You know, keep in mind this girl taught herself to code at the age of seven. 
She oh, wow. did her first hackathon with only adults at the age of nine. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's going to rule the world. She's going to be our boss one day. Oh, yeah. uh, fast forward to today. Yeah. Actually, let's fast forward to when she was 16. Yeah. She became an IBM ambassador oh. in a program. Full disclosure, we totally sneaked her in. I think she was not supposed to be a, a, a minor, but I got a letter from her mom. And I thought, you know what? I'm totally making this happen. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I guess it's not such a secret anymore, but that's okay. She became the youngest IBM IBM intern in the history of IBM across Europe, Middle East, and Africa. She had someone contending for it in Canada, and they're really the really one of two, if any, other miners that mm-hmm. were working inside of the company. I brought her into my team. Now she's spoken at the UN. Mm-hmm. She has, is an advisor for the UK government on digital skills, and she's a true voice of young people. Yeah. She, one day, I said to her, this is her first public speech with me. He, she and I were supposed to be doing it together. She was a nervous Nelly. Mm-hmm. Before she first started talking and doing all this stuff, she would have to have the plan, the questions. And I'm like, I can't wait till you get over this because plan and questions and having this every single time. It's getting old. Mm-hmm. And I was purposely trying to uh, push her to get get outside of her comfort zone mm-hmm. and second guessing herself. Funny enough, we go to present to 10,000 people. Yeah. <laughs> um, my computer dies and I can't get it back up. I'm the moderator. She and I were going to present together. And you know what happened? <laughs> she had to present on her own for 30 <laughs> minutes without me. Yeah. <laughs> She did great. Everyone was like, holy, this was 15. She was 15. Yeah. Oh, wow. Nice. She cried afterward and I had to buy dinner <laughs> or something like that with her dad. Her dad's like, what was that? I'm like, I don't know. I'm sorry. But now we laugh about it. And it, it, I think it's situations like that, that mm. either someone helps to bring us up and reminds us that it's okay to get be in over our head. And sometimes things go well mm. and sometimes things don't. And sometimes we think we crashed and burned. Mm. What in, we, in reality, everyone is, look at the resilience of that 15-year-old. Yeah. And she could have come in and said anything, nothing, didn't matter. Yeah. She was the 15-year-old girl in front of 10,000 people. Yeah, that's true. Sending a message about inclusion and sending a message about young women and girls in tech. Yeah. And showing how she can stand up. And face whatever was in front of her. Mm. Later on, she's oh my gosh, I I was so embarrassed to come back. I'm like, no, you're like a superstar <laughs> now. Like everybody loves you now. Yeah. <laughs> and she's really, but I didn't. Nobody even notices any of that. Yeah, that's it's really great. Unfortunately, we don't have any time no more. But I'm- I know I'm such a chatterbox. <laughs> I used that time to talk about Lella, which by the way, her name is Lella Haloom. Yeah. If you want to look her up, Lola Violet Hloom, and she is an amazing young woman who I don't think suffers from imposter syndrome anymore. Mm -hmm. So if Lola can do it, so can you. Yeah, I I will link the profiles in the show notes below. So have a look. And I just wanted to say thank you. You were so inspiring. Thank you. You, All your stories are so inspiring. (laughs) I've got so many more. (laughs) You always have to stop me because I get down this rabbit hole and I'm like, I'm like there and all of a sudden, because I, I, I remember when that happened, for example, and mm-hmm. I was sitting in my living room. I know exactly where I was sitting, what I was wearing, what was happening, and I got transported to that time. And I think that's the power of storytelling. So yeah. Yeah, I try to do a lot of that in my talks. So Yeah, yeah and I'm, I'm really happy. I, I hope you're, you are a role model for thank all you. these people out thank there. You. Thank and you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this interview. Thank I you. appreciate it. I appreciate <laughs> it. I think you'll probably share how to get connected to me, but anyone who's listening who wants to get connected and wants to chat, I'm always happy to, to stay connected and see what can come of whatever comes. Yeah. So, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.